the evolutionary argument against epiphenomenalism. Yeah, so epiphenomenalism, we say, is like the foam on the waves. Yes. It's, it's there, yeah. it's being caused by the waves, but it has no impact on anything else. Yes, yes, that's a great analogy for it. Joe, you talk about the misuse and failure of the evolutionary argument against epiphenomenalism. So define very briefly epiphenomenalism, what the evolutionary argument is uh, against it, and your analysis of it. Sure. So epiphenomenalism is the view that basically your mind, your experiences especially, do not play any role in causing your behavior. So your behavior is caused purely at a physiological level, and that physiological level is not the same thing in any form as your experiences. Okay, so the evolutionary argument against epiphenomenalism. Yeah, so epiphenomenalism, we say, is like the foam on the waves. Yes. It's, it's there, yeah. it's being caused by the waves, but it has no impact on anything else. Yes, yes, that's a great analogy for it, yeah. So now the evolutionary argument against epiphenomenalism it's an old idea in its basic outlines, um, but it, it's based on two central pieces of evidence, or at least alleged evidence, that human beings evolved largely by natural selection, as well as other animals. And there's a very close correlation between experiences that feel negative in some very primitive, fundamental way, and um, things that stimuli that cause those things, which are bad for you. And similarly, bad for your survival specifically. And on the flip side, experiences that feel good in some fundamental way and things that are positive for your survival. So the evolutionary argument says, um, look, there's a very close correlation between these experiences that are harmful to you, or excuse me, these experiences that feel bad and stimuli that are harmful to you. And similarly for the positive things. Um, if epiphenomenalism were true, um, those experiences would be, you know, like the foam on top of the wave. They would have no impact on your behavior. So those experiences could be absolutely anything, and they wouldn't affect your behavior. So when you're being burned, you know, when, you're, when your hand is being burned on a stove, that could feel ecstatically pleasurable, but you would still withdraw your hand from the stove. Um, uh, maybe actually that's not the best example because it's an automatic reaction, but think of other things. You get stung by a bee, you cut yourself, something like that. That could be really pleasurable, but you would still withdraw your hand and evolution would have happened in exactly the way it did. Um, so this is supposed to be strong evidence against epiphenomenalism because epiphenomenalism doesn't predict this close correlation, but all the other theories of the relationship between experience in the mind do. Um, so then uh, what's the problem with it? Um, I used to, I, when I started off studying this, I thought it was a great argument and I was all set to defend it. But then I realized that it's actually very difficult to show that um, there's some reason why pleasurable experiences should be connected with seeking behaviors and painful experiences should be so associated with avoidance behaviors. I don't think neuroscientists understand pleasure and pain well enough to see why, oh, this architecture that gives rise to, to pain, say, must also give rise to avoidance behavior. When I say pain, I mean the sensation of pain. Um, and without that, it's very difficult to, to make the case that, um, that pleasure will naturally be associated with seeking and pain will naturally be associated with avoiding. And that's a necessary piece of the argument. So that's- that, that, That's a necessary piece of the argument. So what is the uh, potential alternative that is not being considered in that argument? What, what, what is the opposite? Not just that it's not, it's not connected, but there must be another part of that puzzle. Um, yeah, so not, well, not so much that it's not connected because it clearly is, but that it, that it, so, so the, the missing piece is that it must be connected. If it weren't connected, uh, or excuse me, if, if there were the possibility that it wasn't connected, um, you could have all sorts of weird scenarios where, um, like, let's say you get, um, you get cut in your arm, uh, and, 
and, and, and something is threatening you or you get stung by a bee in your arm. That could give you a painful feeling, but that painful feeling could cause you to seek out whatever the thing is that's causing the painful feeling. So, I mean, the way that, you know, evidence works generally is in order for, for something to be evidence against a theory, it has to fit in poorly with what that theory predicts. Mm -hmm. And in order to, to, to um, confirm a theory, it has to fit in well with what that theory predicts. Mm -hmm. So in order, so, so the, the argument is saying the evidence of this correlation fits poorly with epiphenomenalism, but well with the alternatives. But that depends on the idea that the alternatives will all promote both the feeling and the behavior that we associate with that feeling. And that's the tricky part, I think. Yeah, but that seems like a neuroscience problem that uh, can be resolved at some point. Well, and, if, it, yeah, and if that yeah. isn't resolved, would that then in, uh, reinforce the argument against epiphenomenalism? Yeah, it could. It, yeah. So I think I agree. It, it is a neuroscience problem in a sense, but it's not it's not the typical neuroscience problem, because I think the, tip, the typical neuroscience problem is this is how the world is. We're telling you how the world is. This would tell you how the world is, but in a way that also gave you insight into how the world could be in different ways. So if the world, um, you know, so if the brain is constructed in a particular way, um, does that guarantee both that a feeling will be produced and also guarantee a particular behavior that's, you know, that's caused by that feeling? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the crucial piece. It's, it's not so much how do things actually work, but what is the deeper architecture that guarantees both the feeling and the behavior? And the causal relationship between that type of feeling and that type of behavior. So yes, I agree. It, it is a, a kind of neuroscience question. And if neuroscience gave us an explanation, if, if tomorrow neuro, neuroscientists said, look, this is, this is exactly what pain is. And this is exactly why pain has to cause, or at least is very, very likely to cause avoidance in the way mm -hmm. it does then yes, we, that would, I think, rescue the argument. And we'd have, I think for the first time, a really good argument against epiphenomenalism beyond just, oh, it's weird. It doesn't, doesn't mm. fit common sense. Right. Uh, you also uh, make the claim that uh, for, for a stronger result, that the evolutionary evidence is actually what you say is nothing more than a distraction from the elements of the argument that actually gives it its dialectical strength. So yeah. I, I, I wasn't sure where you were going with that. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so I mean, get, fair enough, gives it its dialectical strength, but in a kind of empty way in that it doesn't really have a lot of dialectical strength without that piece. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think without that crucial assumption, you just wind up with some general theories of the relationship between mind and body, right. something like epiphenomenalism, something like interactionist dualism, where right. you get experiences that are probably caused or in some way dependent on physical things happening in the brain, but somehow separate from them. And you get something like physicalism, where roughly speaking, the experiences just are the physical things happening in the brain. Um, if you... Um, if you remove that assumption, all you've got are three different theories that predict who knows what about how that relationship will be. Now, you might say, oh, wait, no, physicalism, that makes a definite prediction. Physicalism predicts that whatever the experiences are um, and whatever the behaviors are, well, those experiences are going to have to cause those behaviors, at least in something that's uh, you know, with an architecture like our brains, where the laws of physics are what they are. That's true, speaking metaphysically, speaking about how things are. But what matters with an argument like this is epistemology, sort of what are we justified in believing? And on the physicalism side, right, even though if a particular brain state, I'm just going to say is identical to pain, that's not strictly speaking, probably the way most philosophers nowadays would put it, but it's good enough for present purposes. If this physical state is identical to pain, 
Um, it's true metaphysically that pain has to be, you know, that's, you know, anyone in that state has to be in pain. But we don't know that going in. And what matters for an argument involving evidence is what possibilities are live. And with physicalism, we have exactly the same sorts of possibilities that are alive to begin with, um, as we do with the, the dualist theories where the two things come apart in their natures. So the th of the three uh, uh, categories of, of consciousness theories, which I think are, if you're going to get three, I think those are three good ones, epiphenomenalism, where consciousness is just the foam on the wave, interactive yeah. dualism, we have two separate entities, and uh, uh, and physicalism, where brain states are the equivalent uh, of, uh, of men mental states, um, where, where, where do you come out? Uh, I come out that they're all they're all out there, and uh, I, I, I luxuriate in each one, but can't adjudicate them. Yeah. Um, I am not I'm not sympathetic to physicalism personally. I think probably one of the other two. Um, now. To some extent, it depends on how you define the physical. So I'll say, I mean, I, I in fact, I, I tell my students this a lot. Say, you know, in, in the history of philosoph philosophical discussion of the mind, it's so much about the mind-body problem. Is the mind physical? Is it not physical? I actually think the deeper question is, can, the can, can minds exist in the natural world? Or do minds require some kind of supernatural intervention? Because I think a lot of the questions about physicalism versus dualism come down to tricky definitional issues about what's physical. Um, but those other, regardless of how you define what's physical, the other sorts of issues are still there and have to be addressed. And associated with that are all sorts of connected issues like panpsychism. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us, and thanks for watching.